Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our risen and ascended Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, back on March 11th in the year 1942, in the war-torn Pacific, 62-year-old General Douglas MacArthur and his family slipped away from the Philippines and miraculously made their way to Australia. Before the general left, however, he made that now famous quote, I shall return. A little more than two and a half years later, on October the 20th, 1944, MacArthur made good on his promise and announced triumphantly, I have returned. By the grace of Almighty God, our forces stand again on Philippine soil. General MacArthur's famous return to the Philippines reminds us of the promise which our Lord Jesus made. Only Jesus' promise was on a much grander scale. On several occasions in Scripture, Jesus reassured his disciples that he shall return. That promise was reiterated by the two men, the two angels there in our first reading from Acts chapter 1 when they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Of course, that's the promise of our Lord that we as his church have been professing throughout the centuries in the creed which we just recited a moment ago when we say, and he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. Thank goodness, my friends, that when he comes again as judge, we have nothing to fear, do we? And of course, the reason we have nothing to fear is because our sin has been paid for, paid for in full. And thanks to the gift of baptism, the gift of faith, we are forgiven and we have been covered with the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Dear friends, the Bible is clear. There is nothing left for us to do in order to be saved. Nothing. Christ Jesus has done it all. Yes, through his perfect life, perfect death, perfect resurrection, he has done it all for you, for me, for this entire world. The privilege we now have as his followers is simply to testify to others what the Lord has done. In other words, as our Lord himself put it, you, you are witnesses of these things. Witnesses. What do you think of that, huh? Sounds easy enough, doesn't it? Or, or does it? Usually this topic of sharing one's faith with others, this topic of witnessing, well, I have found it ranks right up there with preaching about stewardship. We all know that we should be doing these things, but often the reality is that we don't feel real comfortable in carrying out those tasks. I think part of the problem we have with witnessing is that we equate it with evangelism. What about that? Are witnessing and evangelism, are they the same thing? It is true they do have the same goal, and that is to bring others to Christ, to know him and the salvation he freely offers. And those two terms are often used interchangeably, which would give you the impression that they are the same thing. However, there are some differences. And one of the key differences between those two, witnessing and evangelism, it was explained to me by a lawyer of all people using an illustration out of the legal system. The lawyer explained it this way. In most legal briefs, the facts of the case are discussed first. And then after that comes the legal argument. The first section is about witnesses and what they have to say as to what had happened. And the second section is about 
persuasion. This lawyer went on to say that when he writes a brief, his job is to persuade. Sometimes I think we Christians feel that we need to be lawyers, right? That is that we need to persuade. We need to do the, the job of an evangelist when it comes to sharing our faith. Now, friends, there is certainly nothing wrong with wanting to present a good argument as to why we believe that which we believe. And I would be the first to say that growing in knowledge and understanding of one's faith is the duty of every Christian. Hey, but at the same time, don't let your lack of knowledge and understanding prevent you from witnessing. Witnessing is actually very simple. You just tell what you've heard Christ say to you through his holy word and what you have seen him do in your life. That's it. That's all there is to it. You know, I've been in church work for, what, now nearly 30 years of my life. And during that time, I have had the joy of seeing all kinds of people come to faith and, and join the church. What's interesting is that from my observation, the vast majority of, of these new believers were introduced to the faith not by pastors or theologians, not by people with PhDs who could make these uh, great, grand, elaborate arguments. But most of these people came to faith, if you will, came to the Lord's house by plain, ordinary people. People like you all, who simply witnessed their faith. As a matter of fact, some of the most active witnesses in the church today in terms of inviting others to, to come to worship services, to Bible classes, are those who have joined the church in the last year or two, as well as, believe it or not, little children. Huh. Over the years, most of our new member growth right here at St. Peter's has come from our preschool ministry. And I can't tell you how many times a parent will share with me that they came to St. Peter's due to the influence of their little sons or, or, or daughters' witness to them. Dear friends, when it comes down to sharing our faith with others, what is it that we really need in order to, to just do that with, with confidence and with joy? I always thought it was a theological degree that would, you know, do that for me. But in reality, I think I was more active, quite honestly, in sharing my faith before I got my theological degree. I think the reason why that's so is because now with a theological degree and being a pastor, I feel like I'm supposed to have all the answers to everybody's questions. Whereas before that, there was no such pressure. So if it's not a theological degree, then what is it that will give us the confidence, the, the joy we need to just simply share our faith with other people? Well, to answer that question, let's go back to what we are observing here this weekend, the ascension of our Lord. Tell me, when Jesus ascended into heaven, now think about this, how do you understand that event? Do you see his ascension as his leaving us and going to, going to some distant place off wherever? Leaving us to, to what? Now fend for ourselves until he makes his uh, final return here to earth? Is that how you see it? You know, the Lord's ascension is one of those events in the Bible that can be easily misunderstood. I remember watching a movie about the life of Jesus. You know, there's a lot of these movies out over the years that showed his ascension in the closing scenes of the movie. It's kind of a cheesy movie. It showed the actor playing the part of Jesus being lift up, lifted up into the sky as though some sort of cable was, you know, attached to him. 
There he was ascending up into the air while the disciples looked on until the clouds then, you know, they, they do that in Hollywood, uh, hid them from their sight. And just like that, he was gone. And that's kind of the impression you were left with. He's just gone. In some ways, the ascension, if you, if you don't understand it fully, can seem like just a convenient way of explaining why the resurrected Christ is not with us any longer. He's just gone. But friends, is that really what the Bible teaches us? Actually, it isn't. Not at all. You see, when the Bible talks about Jesus' ascension into heaven, it's not talking about a change of location, as though Jesus goes from what, here on earth to there, wherever there may be. Rather, it's talking about a change of condition. You say you don't understand that? Well, perhaps some uh, common expressions that we often use in everyday speech might help us. For instance, we may say something like, did you see old so-and-so? Why, he's really on top of the world. Or, oh, that poor guy, he's really down in the dumps. What does that mean when we say things like that? Obviously, we are describing there a condition, right? Not a location. Well, my friends, the same is true of our Lord's ascension. Upon his resurrection from the dead, our Lord entered into a state, a condition, if you will, of glory. As the Bible says, God the Father exalted him to the highest place. Now, during the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus came out of his glory, you might say, to appear to his disciples. And he did this on on several instances. As you may recall, he ate with them. He walked and talked with them on several occasions. But at the same time, he was not subject to the ordinary processes of, of human existence. He kind of uh, appeared and, and then disappeared at will. Have you ever noticed that when you read the Gospels? Jesus is there post-resurrection, then he's gone, then he's appearing again. And he did that on several occasions to show that he had, in fact, risen from the dead. Now, really, his ascension then was no different than the other appearances and disappearances that Jesus made after his resurrection. The only difference with his ascension here was that this time it would be his final bodily appearance until he returns again in bodily form on the last day. So what's all that have to do with sharing our faith? Well, simply this. When our risen Lord sends us out into our community around us to be his witnesses, when he sends us, my friends, the distance, the distance between us and him is not that great. It really isn't. The early church understood that reality. For example, after Jesus had ascended into heaven, it says in verse 52 of our gospel reading here today that the disciples worshipped Jesus and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Great joy. That's hardly the kind of reaction you would expect from a group of people whose beloved leader was leaving them. And they now had to what? You know, he's no longer around. Did they have to fend for themselves? But you see, that's just it. They had this great joy because they knew they would not have to fend for themselves. They had this great joy because they knew that the risen and ascended Christ would remain true, true to the promise he had said shortly before his ascension. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And not only did the disciples have great joy, but they possessed a confidence, a great confidence, 
when they realized that not only did they have the assurance of the Lord's presence in their lives, but they also had the assurance of his great power. Listen, for instance, to what it says in the last chapter of the Gospel of Mark. I'll read it for you. After Jesus was taken up into heaven, the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by signs that accompanied it. Did you catch it? <laughs> the Lord worked with them, it says. How can that be? If Jesus ascended into, what, outer space, far beyond the, the, the furthest galaxies that exist out there? Well, friends, the reason that can be is just because our Lord has removed his bodily presence from us, that doesn't mean he has removed himself from us. No. No. He is still present with us. Yes, he is through his life-giving word and sacraments, with his great love and forgiveness at work in us as he reigns now as Lord of our lives. And because of that fact, we can, we, you and I, we can with great joy and confidence be witnesses and share with others, the good news of salvation. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.